Hi, this is B from Sorcery Soap, and today we're going to talk about soap proper, um, and therefore soap dough. And if you've been watching this channel for any length of time, you know that's what I focus on is soap dough. And uh, I have written five books, well, to be fair, four books I've written on the topic of soap dough. And the fifth one is, here I'll show you, the fifth one is this massive book of creations I made, soap creations I've made in order to get people interested and inspired. So these are the four books, two of which right here are getting redesigned. So because I am um, now beginning to trust the people that follow this channel, I thought we'd have a talk. And um, <clears throat> The reason I said this is for people that don't know anything about me or don't or haven't ever seen this channel. And this is the first time they've ever seen anything about soap dough. So soap dough is a pliable soap made from cold processed soap. With that said, I thought it was time that we discuss cold processed soap because I do have a video up, which is rudimentary at best, but <clears throat> it was about, excuse me, it was about me um, explaining the, pro the process of cold process, but it was okay. So I thought we'd have a better one. I'd put a better one up for reference material. So <clears throat> in the beginning of all this craziness of soap dough and my education, my self-education to cold process soap, I had lots of questions that I couldn't get answered. And so I bought, oh gosh, some of these books here. I won't leave them on camera very long because I don't want to disparage any, any other authors. I found a couple pieces of information in there. Mostly it's recycled information from other people. Not very well researched and some of the, the recipes are good. I mean, they're fine recipes and if you just want a recipe cookbook for soap, those are great. Um, so I started looking into it and I'm like, where did they get that information? Where, where's all this floating around? Where, like, where are the sources of it? So, there's lots of online only books, which I find incredibly distressing. I mean, I can't actually get them printed because I'm a book person and I like books. So I started looking at, I mean, contacting museums and antiquated book people and uh, random things. Like I read this book on the history of witches and I contacted her to see maybe she, I mean, I just kept turning over every guess clue every rock I thought well maybe it's hidden under here maybe I can find it there so then I decided well we're gonna read this book so this was my nightly reading for a while <laughs> read the entire book um, good information it gives you a broad overview of our history of chemistry and it gave me a lot of names that I wasn't familiar with and who did what and I learned from this book the word Phlogiston. If for those of you who don't aren't familiar with that word like I wasn't, the word phlogiston is a placeholder for a chemical process that happens when um, a material is heated and then loses weight or heated and in, or process opposite and then increases weight. The the difference between this, they had a they knew it was something, so they, they coined it phlogiston, which I just use the word magic or mystery, but um, let me see if I can find that before I continue on to these others, and I'll read it to you. Um, yes, and there was quite, because um, our scientists, this, uh, the scientists that came before us, historically speaking, they used soap in a lot of these experiments, and so I found lots of little pieces of information about soap history in here that I thought might be of interest to you. So, and then there's a lot of political reasons why they didn't bring any of this to the foreground. And some of those political reasons were, uh, very interestingly, that um, if they, okay, it says, no person should either hold or teach any doctrine opposed to Aristotle or the church on penalty of death. Okay, so that's a pretty big reason to keep things secret, right? Here we go. Phlogiston. Combustion has always been considered to be a decomposition, the loss of something. Stahl now introduced a new concept. 
that was that what was lost was phlogiston. Phlogiston was a real substance that was transferred from one chemical to another. In smelting an ore heated with charcoal turned into a metal because phlogiston was transferred from the charcoal to the ore. On the other hand, in calcination, when the metal was heated in air, it became a powder or calyx because it lost phlogiston. Calcination and smelting were just reversible back and forth transfers of phlogiston. In effect, that was the first recognition of the fact that calcination is simply a slow combustion of metal. Phlogiston was also the ingredient that made alkalis caustic and powerful. When lime, limestone, soda, and potash were heated to high temperatures, they changed into quicklime, caustic soda, or lye. And a caustic potash, potash lye, because they picked up phlogiston from the fire. When these caustics were kept in open containers at room temperature, they became mild and lost their potency because their phlogiston leaked out into the air. Now, I don't have any argument with the fact that they didn't understand it and that they were deciding that they're going to hold that placeholder. The argument I have is that previously in this book, they claim... Um, so here's the other thing. I'm trying to do some critical thinking, okay? They claim that soap was primarily produced not for use in personal hygiene, but for the cloth industry centered in medieval Flanders. Okay, so if you want me to believe in phlogiston, but then you're telling me that soap was produced only for the cloth industry and that human beings were dirty because they were uneducated, I have a problem with that. And here's why. Because my common sense says to me that when I am dirty, I clean myself. There are a lot of people that when they're dirty, they do clean themselves. Some people will say that they smell and though that'll be their initiation into starting to clean themselves as adolescents. Other people have a process, they clean themselves every few days or whatever. But to tell me that the only time we had soap was to use it to make cloth. We were intelligent enough to make cloth in the whole process of urine extraction and all that other process to make cloth and clean that cloth. But we weren't smart enough to use the cloth on our, or to soap on our bodies. Anybody that works with, with any kind of material knows that your hands and soap go into water and they come out cleaner. It didn't take a rocket science scientist to figure it out. It's common sense. You go into water, how are you going to scrub any kind of oil or harsh dirt on your body off with just water? It doesn't work. So the cloth makers, if nothing else, let's just give them that much, give the historians the benefit of the doubt, if nothing else, that, that the cloth makers knew that this chemical process, this soap, this alkaline substance that they were using to clean cloth, could take it home to their families. Say, oh, here, use this, hon. Use it on the pots and pans instead of dirt, instead of sand to scrub it off. Okay, so let's move on. So that's one, one process of this. This book, valuable book, I highly recommend it. Lots of information, obviously. This is only some of it I highlighted and I don't usually bend the corners, but I just mutilate this book, but it's still a very good book. Found this book hard hard to find this book has so much information in it so this was printed in soap making at uh, um this is an educational booklet let's see oh 1957 sixth edition 1957 uh January 1952 was the first published edition of this. So 1952, okay? And so here's some of the information that is in this book that I found incredibly helpful. Um, let's see, I'll just read this page. Of all the many industries which serve the modern housewife today, there is no uh, there is none with a longer and more complex history than soap making. When one begins to trace back its origin, um, one finds, as in so many trades, that the first clues and hints nearly all originate from the ancient centers of culture that once bordered on the Mediterranean. This is not surprising, for the raw material materials of soap making were easily available in those parts. There was a natural soda to be found in the Nile Valley, and animal and vegetable fats were also ready at, to hand. 
Indeed, in its fundamental principles, the art of soap making changed little till the chemical discoveries of the late 18th century. Okay. From Egypt, the art was carried by those hardy seafarers, the Phoenicians, to the south of France, 600 years before the birth of Christ, and thence, nice word thence, by the way, it spread north into Germany, west into Spain, and east into Italy. But it is strange to find that the Romans, 600 years later, were learning the art from the Gauls and the Germanic tribes. Even then, the Sapo spoken of by Pilony the Elder, writing in AD 70, which a lot of soap makers quote, by the way, was more of a hair pomade than a soap. But Pilony tells us that the best ingredients were goat tallow and beech ashes the equivalent of the modern palm oil and caustic. So that is what, so that, so that it was soapy in the nature of, if nothing more. So I find that interesting that um, our history of soap making, because nobody's really going to point it out because it's just not important to anybody else. It is important to me. And I want to share that. So um, not only do I want to share the history of soap making, but I'm going to get to this. I also want to explain some of the reasons. I'm giving you some history, and I'll explain some of the reasons why I talk about soap in the way I do. So the other thing that happens, so, so there's a lot of, mm, we're going to call them G's for right now, um, that want to control their people. And I don't know, I'm pretty frustrated if I can't wash. I get pretty frustrated if I can't wash. So one of the things that happened, which I found interesting, was that soap was taxed. It was levied by the king at one point so heavily that it didn't, they couldn't make, the, the soap makers couldn't make any soap because uh, that it was a wash. They weren't making any profit on it. And so the soap makers, it was sort of like um, a big, uh, cessation of soap making and this was in let's see um in england the first patent for soap making was in 1662 wait it goes back here the history of soap making from the 17th century onwards is a story of struggle against monopoly and taxation the control of the manufacture of soap seems to have had had some peculiar attractions for wait i probably should put my right glasses on the control of the manufacture of soap seems to have had some peculiar attraction for the legislatures, legislators and officials. In France, hmm, the king in France, which is Louis IV, had granted to one Pierre Rigaud a complete monopoly of soap manufacture for 20 years. And at the end of the century, manufacture was even prevented entirely during certain months of the year. These restrictions began only being only swept away by the revolution of 1793. Okie dokie. So then there was a tax so high. Um, they're giving me a bunch of details in here or giving us a bunch of details. And finally, there's a chancellor that came along and, and abolished the duty tax. And the revenue was as high as 1.1 to wait $1,126,000 okay he abolished the duty the revenue was as high as 1 million uh, this was in 17 oh wait the excise duty between da, 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 1852 $1 million in 1852 because of soap because why people like to clean themselves they like to clean their clothes so, okay, keep telling me how we don't, we aren't clean people. So that part for somebody who decides that phlogiston actually exists. Now they've debunked the idea of phlogiston, by the way. And I, again, I don't begrudge them because it was a placeholder. So here's another book right here, this one. Rather hard to find in a proper copy. You can get this online and print it out. This book is a Xerox copy of another book, so I'm missing a lot of words, which is really distressing to me. But it was, gosh, all these books, you know what it costs to get in a proper book. It's ridiculous. So I'm painting a picture. I'm giving you bits of information so that when I start to tell you about some of my ideas about cold processed soap, they seem a little bit different than most people. And this is why. 
because I've actually done some of this research to the best of my ability. And I know somebody that was going to go to the, the Museum of Soap and I was so excited because I wanted to see what they're presenting as that. And, and here we're in a day and age where we have to think for ourselves. We have to have some critical thought for ourselves because what is presented, and if you surface the news, for example, if you surface anything, you're not going to get the actual truth because it's all a facade, all of it. And this is why I'm explaining this, and I'm, I don't want to edit this. I just want to share it with you. Because if I was talking to you, this is what I would say. Only I would say it probably in conversational mode. And I think I've learned a great deal from being a hunter, hunting through all these books to look for that one. I read this entire book, by the way, this entire book, of many, many books, in order to find out how the housewives, what they thought of soap. That's all I wanted to know is what they thought. I didn't see that I was going to get any recipes, any. I wanted insight to their mindset about soap. They were very, the tutors, very, very interested in hygiene. Now, that's not the history that I was given. Not at all. There were kings that were superstitious, just in case you were interested. So superstitious, queens, so superstitious that they would take a bath once a year and proud of it. That doesn't mean everybody was that way. They were also very much being, they were inbreeding. So they were a different mindset than, I don't have any royal blood in me. I'm not a, a rich aristocrat. I don't have servants. I don't think like that. I want okay, so this book is called The Art of Soap Making, A Practical Handbook of the Manufacture of Hard and Soft Soaps, Toilet Soaps, etc., including an appendix of modern candle making. Now, some of my, some of the... <laughs> titles of my books are rather long but not that long anyway but it's it's pretty explanatory so I've read this entire book by the way yes and it's mostly dry and very boring but I wanted to scour it to see okay so here we go into saponification the actual and proper way soap is made no wait before I get to that let me okay so this is Mr. William Howe is, is the founder and the inventor of cold process soap. If you didn't know that, that's who he is. That's who is the founder of cold process soap. And um, he, okay, and so before I go on to that, I, I don't know that I've ever read that in any other book. Like, that should be important information to our soap making history, right? You would think that. So there's another guy, because, you know, Let's see. So this is cold process, by the way. This isn't Marseille soap. This isn't um, olive oil soap. This isn't any of those soaps. Those are different. Those are much more complex histories. I'm just talking about cold process. So just to be clear. Okay. So here we go. It had long been the desire of soap makers to possess some process of saponification less tedious and costly than the ordinary systems of soap boiling. The previous part of this book talks about soap boiling, which as we know is hot process soap, but that's another thing. It was well known that caustic al alkalis would convert into a saponosaceous, that's a very weird word, but matter, fats, and oils without the application of heat. And it was also well known that during the process of saponification, word missing, the ordinary system of boiling over caustic lyes, a considerable amount of glycerin was set free and which being a substance soluble in water passed away with the spent or waste lyes, causing a direct and positive loss in the manufacturer. One of the things they did is they washed their soap with lye and all that water was that's a whole complicated process I can't get into at this moment. So anyway, Hawes system, one of the most ingenious practical attempts to modify the ordinary system of soap making was that, de was that devised by, I, I don't know, I'm missing a word, so I'm sorry. Mr. William Hawes, a gentleman who had long been connected with the soap trade and was in, indeed a member of one of the largest and most enterprising firms in London. The, the process is well known as the cold process. 
and is thus described by the inventor. And he goes on and he talks about how many tons of tallow he makes. And at the time, like that makes sense for commercial, for commercial use because, oh, once again, I will point out and be redundant, nobody uses bar soap. Nobody uses soap flakes because we're unclean humans. But he's making right here, he talks about a recipe for two and a half tons of soap. That's one person. Um, so then, okay, I'm going to get more to this. You don't have to worry about the rest of that information because you can read it, obviously, but this is the, this is the, the, the core of what I was looking for. So motion being communi communicated to the machine and the cauldron having been previously charged with the tallow, which I don't really quite get that part. The lie is to be gradually added thereto and in a short time, every particle of the fatty matter will be brought into an intimate contact with the alkaline lye. That is translation, we stick blend our soap. Okay, you have to use a mechanical device. We want it intimately contacted with the lye, the fats in the lye slash water, okay. And by such means, pontification will take place. That's all we have to do is get them to, to match together and they'll take place. Saponification will take place. Saponification is the process, of course, you know that if you're watching this, of making into soap. Um, the stirring is continued for about three hours or until tallow appears completely saponified as in indicated by the mass thickening after which it is allowed to stand from uh, something to four days, I don't know, three to four days according to the quantity of the paste. So that makes sense, right? So, but he's talking about tons, three to four days. And so when I say take soap dough and you don't want it to touch it for 24 hours, and people think that they can make it in a couple hours, and they can, it's not gonna be great. So, and there's another process that happens that um, there's just enough water evaporation in the soap, cold process soap to make soap dough. And they talk about soap dough in here, they talk about it. So the reason I say that is because they didn't talk about it the way I talk about it at all but they talked about the leftover paste slash dough. They used the word dough, which I found really interesting. And I didn't know that until after I'd written my books. That is a fascinating point because they understood what they were doing. They just didn't do anything with it. They would take some of their scrap and put it into molds, but they didn't do anything with it like I do or like we do. Okay, so more to the point. So now, you understand what I'm talking about. Now, Kevin Dunn has written this book, very good book, uh, complicated. It's a complicated book, but I found some pieces in here that I like that help me explain the process of what I was watching with soap dough. And I will explain those also. He talks about water discounts. So one of the things he talks about, cold process warms more slowly and stays warm longer, indicating that the that the saponification is slower at low temperatures. Okay, slower at low temperatures. So, obviously we know hot process, heat goes right up. We apply outside heat to hot process. We mix it up. Okay, and so the graph, if I can find the, a graph, I'll put it here. The graph starts hot and then it gradually goes down pretty quickly and it comes to room temperature, right? So with cold process and soap dough, therefore, cold process is heated between 80 because we have to, most coconut oil, all coconut oil I use, is supposed to melt at 76 degrees. It doesn't melt fully until 80 degrees. So they call it 76, but it doesn't melt fully until 83 degrees, something like that. I don't ever go over 90 degrees, 92 tops. That's what I consider room temperature, and that's considered cold process because there's no outside heat added to it. So we take those temperature oils, our moderately room temperature lye, which is within the same temperature, this is all in Fahrenheit, and we apply those, and then we use a mechanical device to agitate them so that the lye and the caustic soda, uh, the, I'm sorry, the lye and the lye water and the fats and oils come into intimate contact. To recap, Cold process soap is done at room temperature. Sands heat, we don't apply heat to it. So um, what we do do, we apply, mm, doo -doo, I know, we apply 
mechanical device, i.e. stick blender in this case. So we want the fats, however, oils, butters, whatever, the fats, um, and the lye water. The water is the carrier for lye, makes it more fluid, otherwise you're just putting little speckles of soap or flakes or whatever, right? So it's the carrier, it dissol dissolved it, and now it's gonna carry the lye, and you agitate it, and it brings it together. Intimate contact, like our forefathers told us. Um, I'd say foremothers, but there's no documentation of that. There's very little documentation, however, I did find, and I don't know if I can let's see if it's in here. I didn't highlight it, I don't think. Have to go through. Oh, wait, I did. Um, well, I did highlight a lot of stuff. Okay, so I'll go back and clear this up and, and explain some of this to you. But take my, you can take my word for it or not. I don't know. I, didn't, I did read the book, but one of the things I discovered in there is that women had been boiling, as in, see this picture right here? boiling clothes with soap for a long time and they decided the whiter the, the whiter their cloth was the higher their status so they wanted to keep their cloth really white and that was really important to them okay so hopefully i've made some sense about this cold processed soap and now i want to talk to you about soap dough and why why soap dough works the way it does. So cold processed soap is what I just described to you. It is starting at room temperature, a chemical heating process bringing it up to a higher temperature, saponification going, and as the following 24 hours, now you're gonna make soap within this 24 hours. In order to get the heat to dissipate from it and for it to come back to room temperature, it generally takes 24 hours. I unmolded a soap the other day, wasn't done doing its thing, I molded 18 hours, I left it on the counter, didn't cut it, and it got ash, the whole thing, because the, the lye of it, the soda, N-A-O-H, was still working. It was still working within the soap, and I exposed all this to air, and it got... Now, also, fragrance oils, that's a whole other topic, but fragrance oils can actually inhibit or accelerate that heat process. So. Cold process, we use a chemical heat. And the chemical heat and the agitation of the stick blender. So we can do this with a spatula and stir and stir and stir. That soap that I was telling you about did not get enough uh, stick blending time. And I hand stirred it because I wanted a really fluid pour. I didn't give it enough time to have intimate contact to agitate all that and therefore I got a sort of chalky-like soap that it's better today, but it could have been way better had I just stick blended for a couple more minutes. There's a very fine line for that too. So I try to explain a lot of this cold process. No, I do, I explain a lot of soap dough. So stack of books, I've thought the topic was so important that I continue to write and write and write about, here, I'll put them here but about soap dough, because the process of soap dough is um, me explaining phlogiston, essentially. Um, it is a process that's been around. We just didn't know it. We didn't talk about it. We didn't see it as valuable. We didn't use it. It was a soap paste that was disregarded for the most part or seen as scrap. And so what I did was pull that idea into hyper-focus because it is, I thought it was a useful tool. And that is because I very much don't waste things. I also look at the world like, what can I do with this? Like, what can I, not what the industrialists tell me to do, not what, generally speaking, not what anybody tells me to do. And I don't mean that in a, in a adolescent resistant way. I think for myself, it's a lot of work to think for yourself. It's a lot of work to try and conclude things for yourself. But I got tired of saying things didn't make sense to me. I'm going to make sense for myself. So if that helps you with the soap process, and if you think that this like little bit of information, um, it's, you know, 20 minutes or something, is helpful, I'll do some more talks about some of the soap history I've uncovered because there's so many little things that I've discovered that are really, really helpful. And um, so in our soap history. So one of the things, okay, 
to clarify and to summarize, women, this is part that intrigued me the most, just, just to put that out there. What intrigued me the most is that here I am in the 20, oh, 21st century, confusing, but whatever, saying I'm a soap witch because I make something that other people hadn't made or seen or whatever. And so I started listening to myself and saying, why would I call myself a soap witch? I mean, what, why was it so fun to call sorcery soap, sorcery soap, and to think that, uh, that this process of soap making was so much sorcery, right? And where did all this thought process come from? And then, so I looked at my contemporary life and then I started going back and back and back. And so I read, oh, as many books as you've just seen, that's how many books I've read on witchcraft and the tri witch trials. And the reason I've read those, because I was intrigued with them as a child, is because I wanted to know about why some women are focused on, why they are brought to the surface. Is it because they, only because they slept with the wrong man? That's an easy explanation. Women don't like that when their husbands sleep around and they blame the woman. I understand that. Is it because they understood midwifery? Is it because they understood herbs? Is it why that's all I wanted to know is why and so in the process of that this to me looks very reminiscent of a woman that we've seen in pictures doing chores innocently over a cauldron this book talks about a soap cauldron the words are systemic throughout all this material and so I'm like when did they make that shift Women who could do soap magic by making white magically had these secrets of tricks of the trade that had all these secrets to get stains out of cloth and make cloth super white and um, learn how to scrub pots and clean, keep their house amazingly clean, all these things. Oh, might be a little bit magical. How do they do that? Oh, it must be magic because I don't know about it, so therefore it's magic. In a bad way, though. In a bad way. So that's why I'm talking about this, is trying to put it out and explain to you where my information comes from. So uh, the contemporary authors on soap making weren't satisfactory to me, hence why I've written some books. I wanted to bring some pieces of that out, which I haven't written enough about the history. I've put pieces in. Um, planted seeds about that. Um, there's lots of controversy about um, uh, Pompeii as well. Uh, some people said that they had a soap making factory and then other people contradict that and said that it wasn't a soap making factory and it was this, that and the other. And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, there were soap recipes. I discovered soap recipes. I didn't discover the recipes themselves. I discovered information about soap recipes written in cuneiform, which is our oldest living record of written language cuneiform now personally you have to be pretty committed to put something in stone uh, a recipe in stone so and that's what cuneiform was usually done it was a little stylus of a triangle ish shape and then they push it into clay and they'd use these pe these clay pieces as um, bill of lading or purchase receipts or recipes so I don't know about you, but it took me a while to, to discover the fact that one of our oldest soap makings, it was a very simple soap recipe. And one of our oldest soap recipes is in cuneiform. Cuneiform is our oldest written language, way before anything else, way before um, the turn of the, the, the beginning of this century, not century, this uh, period of time. So at the zero point, anyway, we're going to start getting into BC, AD. So I don't know, I can't remember what the date was, but it was cuneiform was around long before that. And, and long before we zeroed out our calendar, or put it that way. And then um, the Mesopotamians got a hold of it because they were, um, so the, it was just easy commerce to get a hold of some of those tablets and to see what everybody else was doing because that's where all, con that was the, the center of commerce for the, the whole entire world was the Mesopotamia area. And I find it interesting that one of the riots in the Middle East, they defaced these old statues. Just a piece, just to find it interesting. Um, because 
if we don't know what our history is at any form, any, any bit of our history, how can we understand how to move forward? We just think we appeared with uh, talking devices attached to our hands. So anyway, I, if you run across any books on soap making or old soap books, or I, I would appreciate it if you send them my way or just tell me the titles. I, I mean, really, I'll, I'll buy them and look into them and see if they're valuable to me. Because I know like, oh, I went to an uh, um, uh, old bookstore. Oh, I love this bookstore. So wonderful. And I saw in here that there was some information on soap making. So I started to read this. And I thought that was valuable just because they have like soap presses and they have soap... Um, uh, they have soap machines that they make with agitation and a, a whole variety of things in here that I have yet to read this book. But then there was another one that I don't even hesitate. Like, and I saw this one at Edgar Casey. Now I don't really, I'm not a believer. Okay. So I'm not a believer, but Ed, Edgar Casey had some serious insights to things that I don't know how he got that. And so I thought he has, this whole book is on castor oil of all things for crying out loud i was like he has a whole philosophy on castor oil that's crazy so i'm working on reading that too so tell me if this helped or if you have any questions i know i covered a lot of material and i didn't format it because i just wanted you to hear how some of the things i wanted this to be out there so i'll make another video just in cold process soap like i did before um i guess i just I have very, like, you know, I make these little sound bites and they're just, they're, they're, I don't know. I'm not that person. I need to have the full picture. So that's why I make the full picture as best I can. So anyway, thanks for your patience and thanks for watching and thanks for listening and um, leave in the comments below and tell me what you think. And I have lots of information about soap dough and there's a little, um, at the top of the channel, um, Right under the banner, there's a little magnifying glass. And if you put a term in there and search it, you could search my whole channel. And so if I probably have, I have over hmm, 250 videos or something. So you probably could find an answer to that. I've talked about a lot of stuff. So anyway, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate all the comments lately. That's really cool. It makes me happy that there are kind people in this world. So there you go. Thanks. Bye.